to pan będzie przedstawiał pana dyrektora, tak? Yeah. 
Proszę Państwa, dzień dobry. Tak, wszystko działa. Halo, czy wszyscy nas słyszą? Halo, ja słyszę. Czy ktoś mnie słyszy? Good morning everyone. Welcome to our sixth annual conference, na szóstej konferencji, dorocznej konferencji Pamięć Pokoleń. We're going to begin with the Sibirak anthem. And then we will begin our proceedings after that. Kresowych wschodnich osad i wsi, z rezydencji białych dworków i chat, myśmy wciąż do niepodległej wsi, wsi z uporem ponad dwieście lat, wydłużyli drogę carscy kaci, przez Syberię wiódł najkrótszy znak. I w Kajmanach szli konfederaci, mogiłami znacząc polski brak. Z instrukcji kościół szkolski z podstaw dwóch, szkół parykat w Warszawy i Łodzi. Konradowski unosił się tu i nam marczył do Polski przewodzi. Myśmy szli i szli dziesiątkowani Przez kraj gęstety plątaniną dróg A myśmy szli i szli niepokonani A stóp nad Wisłą radował nam Bóg A myśmy szli i szli dziesiątkowani Przez kraj gęstety plątaniną dróg A myśmy szli i szli niepokonani, a wśród nad bitwą karował sam Bóg. Z miast kresowych wschodnich osad i wsi Szkółku rzędów i kamienic i chat Myśmy znów do niepodległej wsi Jak z taboru sprzed dwudziestu lat Bo od września od siedemnastego Muszą drogą znów przed każdy z nas Przez brud z podbiegu na północnego przez Lubiankę, przez Katyński nas Na nieludzkiej ziemi znowu polski brak Wyznaczyli bezimienne szyże Nie zatrzymał nas czerwony kat Bo przed nami Polska coraz bliżej I myśmy szli, i szli dziesiątkowani Radą pragną nas podzielić dróg I przez ludową przeszliśmy niepokonani Aż wolną Polskę raczył wrócić Bóg I myśmy szli i szli dziesiątkowani Choć z radą pragną nas podzielić dróg I przez ludową przeszliśmy niepokonani Aż wolną Polskę Radzim wrócić u Dziękuję.
wszystkim. Na początek poproszę tylko, aby... I would like to ask the Sibirax to remain standing and everybody else to have a seat. Witamy was. Bo to w pamięć was i waszych przeżyć to wszystko czynimy. Um, I'll switch across to English. We do have simultaneous translation. If somebody doesn't understand the English, it'll be easier for me. Proszę już usiąść. Dziękuję bardzo. I poproszę um, na scenę pana Tomasza Kuba Kozłowskiego z Domu Historii, z Domu Słodkań z Historii i pana Mieczysława Powodzińskiego, przedstawiciela zarządu Związku Sybiraku. To ask Mr. Tomasz Kuba, Kuba Kozłowski from the History Meeting House and Mr. Mieczysław Pogodziński from the Sibirak Association to come up to the stage, please. Uh, welcome to all of our guests, including Mr. Adam Chlebowicz, Director of the National Education Bureau of the Institute of National Remembrance, who will share with us in a few minutes. Also, I would like to welcome all our guests and uh, delegates from all the countries who are here personally and also attending our program on the internet. Just one small logistical issue. Jeżeli ktoś chciałby wziąć udział w naszej dzisiejszej kolacji, to um, A to znaczy we wtorek, przepraszam, będzie msza Sybiraków w katedrze polowej i załatwiamy autokar z Muzeum Katyńskim. Chcemy wiedzieć, ilu ludzi planuje być na tym. We would like to know how many Oh. Let them know how many people, because we're arranging transport afterwards. Um, please also tell Ivona if you are coming. Proszę powiedzieć Iwonie, jeżeli państwo planuje być na tym, abyśmy mogli załatwić transport do Muzeum Katyńskiego. No to już może od razu podam, podam mikrofon um, panu Kozłowskiemu, uh, aby nas powitał w imieniu Domu Spotkań Historii. Który... Give the floor to Mr. Tomasz Kuba Kozłowski to welcome us on behalf of uh, the History Meetings House. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the director of the History Meetings House, Mr. Piotr Jakubowski, who could not attend this morning, I would like to welcome uh, you all to our um, Karo, to number 20 Karova building. It's um, another year of our cooperation, which I hope will last until the end of the world and a, and a day. We also hope that especially those who are not scattered across the world and they're able to take advantage of our uh, resources uh, will visit us in the next days, weeks, months, and years to come. Because every month we have a, a special offer of a variety of events for those who are scattered across the continents. We hope that at least from time to time we will be able to um, broadcast our meetings um, on the internet, some of them even live. So please follow uh, uh, what is happening on Karova Street, especially that we're looking at a season of important history, historic uh, anniversaries. So one more time, welcome to all of you, especially those coming from all corners of the world. Uh, we want to welcome you to our home. 
On behalf of uh, the board of the Sibirak Association, I would like to welcome everyone who has come from various countries and also the C local Sibiraks who have come this morning. This conference is very important to us Sibiraks because we continue working to commemorate what happened um, 80 years ago in our operations here in Warsaw, where uh, we still have more than 1,000 Sibiraks living and over 20,000 living across the country, we do all we can to commemorate the um, the turmoil we have exper we experienced. And this year we have already organized several um, significant events, commemorative events. The first one was a meeting in Wrocław. Wrocław is a city where um, most of the Sibiraks uh, have settled after returning to the so-called regained territories. We have uh, also built and consecrated a memorial, a 30, uh, 30th anniversary um, memorial, because this year was 30 years since we have um, resumed the activities of the Sibiriak Association after a long period of silence on this topic when our persecutor was treated as a friend. So we had to be careful not to speak about these matters. Uh, another great event dedicated to the commemoration of uh, the experiences of the Sibiraks was a the great um, March of Remembrance the, that takes place annually, and this was this year's this year was our nineteenth um, March of Re Remembrance in Białystok. It is important that there were about one hundred eighty flags of and. Um, the number of attendees, including young people, were about 12,000, which included Poles from Lith Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Belarus, and Ukraine. There were also representatives from the UK and the US. So this is very important to um, maintain this remembrance, this memory, and so one more time, I would like to thank you all for coming, especially those who have come from faraway um, countries to cultivate the memory of their parents, mothers, fathers, and grandparents. This is very important, immensely important to remember and also to guide uh, the young generation which will take over after us and we need to prepare them to maintain the memory so thank you one more time for coming and i hope you um i, I wish you all the luck for um today Moving on to our program, I would like to mention that we owe a lot to the Polish state because 10 years ago we have some anniversaries, uh, centenary of regaining the uh, Kresy and then last this year 80 years since the invasion, the Soviet invasion, but also our 10th, anniver 10th anniversary of the foundation of the virtual, the Crescent Siberia Virtual Museum. So 
it's uh, uh, 10 years since we opened the museum um, and that was uh, with the help and cooperation of the Polish state for which we as members, both uh, Polish, Poles in Poland and uh, members of the Polish diaspora, we are very grateful. We would like to say thank you and perhaps Today, um, the director of the Educational Bureau, um, National Education Bureau of the Institute of National Remembrance, could receive um, our thanks on behalf of the Polish state. And please come and take the floor. Thank you. Teraz mnie słychać lepiej. Jeszcze raz witam, zatem bardzo miło z Państwem się spotkać w Domu Spotkań z Historią. To przesłanie Państwa zjazdu, konferencji Pamięć Pokoleń to jest takie przesłanie, które towarzyszy nam w pracy Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej, a może szczególnie biura, którym kieruję, czyli Biura Edukacji Narodowej bo nasza oferta skierowana jest głównie do młodego pokolenia Polaków, dzieci, młodzieży, ale oczy, oczywiście również do dorosłych. Jednym z takich podstawowych czynników, najważniejszych jest, jest rzeczywiście pamięć pokoleń, przekazywania tej pamięci kolejnym pokoleniom. Ta oferta, którą chcę Państwu w wielkim skrócie przedstawić, nawet to, ta ilustracja, którą Państwo tutaj widzicie, to słynne, zachowane, jedno z nielicznych zdjęć malowania Polski Walczącej, słynnej kotwicy i, i współczesna młodzież polska, która formuje ten znak z, z samych siebie, no to jest być może właśnie to, to najlepsze przesłanie, do, do którego chcemy trafić. O, coś jednak nadal, nadal nie działa. Dobrze. Przedstawię Państwu to, czym, czym się zajmuję. Istnieje prawie 20 lat, kilka miesięcy nas dzieli od rocznicy dwudziestolecia powstania Instytutu Pamięci Narodowej. W ramach struktur IPN-u działa kilka biur. Głównie są to oczywiście biura merytoryczne, takie jak archiwum, chyba najważniejsza część Instytutu. To wszystko, co żeśmy przejęli po aktach SB, MO, prokuratury i tak dalej. To jest około 100, 100 km akt, żebyście Państwo sobie uświadomili. To jest tyle, ile IPN w tej chwili posiada w swoich zasob zasobach i te zasoby są ciągle powiększane. Biuro Badań Historycznych to są badania naukowe, Biuro Poszukiwań, to jedno z bardziej znanych biur kierowane przez profesora Krzysztofa Szwagrzyka, Biuro Upamiętnień i biuro, którym ja kieruję, czyli Biuro Edukacji. Tu mamy oczywiście te podstawowe odniesienia, którymi się zajmujemy. Ten plakat, który Państwo widzicie, będzie wielka albo nie będzie jej wcale, to tytuł naszej wystawy poświęconej, poświęconej walkom o granicę lat 1918, 21, 22, w zależności jak, jak, to, jak to uznamy. No, oczywiście mamy w już wspomniane przez Pana Prezesa, rok wyjątkowy, można powiedzieć każdy z lat jest wyjątkowy, w zeszłym roku stulecie odzyskania niepodległości, w tym roku 75. rocznica powstania warszawskiego, 80. rocznica wybuchu wojny. 
W tym roku bardzo mocną uwagę zwracaliśmy na, na datę 23 sierpnia 1939 roku. Datę, która stosunkowo słabo funkcjonuje w polskiej świadomości. To znaczy mówimy o 1 września jako dacie wybuchu wojny, ale oczywiście nie byłoby 1 września, gdyby nie pakt ribbentrop mołotow bądź pakt Hitler-Stalin. To wszystko, co się wówczas wydarzyło w Moskwie, czyli tajne klauzule, klauzule ten podział i jakby zamiar agresji, która się spełniła w najbliższych dniach, tak naprawdę to jest, to jest ta data, która, która początkuje II wojnę światową, straszną wojnę z ogromnymi skutkami i plany, które zostały wówczas powzięte, plany, które były przygotowane wcześniej, zostały z całą bezwzględnością zrealizowane. Tutaj można jeszcze wspomnieć o tym, że w myśl tego, co zapisano 23 sierpnia, ta linia podziału pomiędzy Sowietami a, a Niemcami hitlerowskimi miała przebiegać gdzie indziej, właśnie przez środek Warszawy, czyli ta część wschodnia Warszawy miała należeć do Sowietów, a, a część zachodnia do, do Niemiec. Dopiero tam następne wydarzenia z września zmieniły tą sytuację. Chciałbym powiedzieć właśnie o kilku, o kilku naszych projektach i to, czym się zajmujemy. Niezwyciężenie 1920 obrońcy ojczyzny. Takim bardzo ważnym odznaczeniem, czyli dwoma właściwie oznaczeniami, medalem i krzyżem niepodległości, które były jednym z najważniejszych uhonorowań bohaterów walki o niepodległość, tych medali i krzyży przyznano w okresie międzywojennym 88 tysięcy. Tylu ludzi zostało nimi oznaczonych. Oczywiście w PRL-u w latach powojennych wiedza na temat tego odznaczenia i na temat tych bohaterów były cenzurowane, spychane do, do nieświadomości. Jednym z naszych celów było przywrócenie informacji, wiadomości, świadomości o tych, o tych odznaczeniach, stąd tytuł Niezwyciężeni. I muszę powiedzieć, bo w tym roku mamy finał drugiej edycji tego konkursu. Generalnie rzecz biorąc chodziło nam o to, żeby dzieci i młodzież, tam jest podział na dwie kategorie wiekowe, żeby poszukali wśród swoich bliskich przodków, ale także być może bohaterów, którzy mieszkają, mieszkali obok nich, pochodzą z ich terenów, właśnie tych ludzi oznaczonych krzyżem bądź medalem niepodległości. I muszę powiedzieć, że ten konkurs, ten, ten pomysł przeszedł nasze najśmielsze oczekiwania, bo kłopot polegał na tym, że dużo prościej jest młodym ludziom spotykać się ze świadkami historii, kiedy usłyszą państwa opowieści, opowieści Sybiraków, kiedy usłyszą opowieści powstańców warszawskich, kontakt z żywym człowiekiem, to przynosi zupełnie inne... We're speaking about the heroes of the independence struggle of 1914 through 1918 and then the Polish-Bolshevik war and they are not among the living any longer. So it's much more difficult to stir the imagination of the young men and women and encourage them to uh, research this history. So we were able to um, reach out to this new generation And so we encourage the young people to uh, go to listen to the stories of their grandfathers and their fathers. So I want, could quote two stories uh, that we heard. One of them is the story of a uh, Polish uh, um, person from today's Lviv. It's the story of his uh, grandfather. The, uh, Uh, family decided to stay in Lviv after the loss, after Poland lost the city, and the independence le medal that this gentleman was uh, awarded was buried in his backyard in Lviv, and the documents uh, were the documents were um, found buried uh, in the 1970, and uh, the grandson discovers the story of his family. And the second one is the story of two students from Chicago who uh, found a lady uh, also awarded the uh, Medal of Independence who became um, outside of the, who ended up outside the country after World War II. And then the Stones of Remembrance, participants of the Polish Bolshevik War is Uh, another project to commemorate the uh, uh, next year's anniversaries of the victories on the Vistula and Nieman River. 
Kresse or the borderlands, the eastern borderlands is uh, another um, big uh, project that we want to take care of. The Institute of National Remembrance organizes a competition, a history competition dealing with the um, the 20th century's history of uh, the uh, Polish eastern borderland borderlands, we uh, try to um, take the Poles uh, from Poland, Polish young people from Poland to the former Polish uh, borderlands because uh, um, it's very rare that they are, are able to visit today's Lithuania, Belarus or um, Ukraine and places in Russia that connected with the Katyn massacres. This year, a group of uh, students are um, traveling through uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and Latvia. The purpose of this trip is uh, to connect these young people with uh, the living Polish history, with this heritage that has been lost but is still remains in those uh, regions. A very important element is the meetings of those young people with their peers in Grodna, Minsk, uh, uh, Vilnius, places connected with the memory of Marshal Piłsudski. Uh, very often our um, young compatriots Uh, their uh, awareness uh, gain their uh, this awareness during those meetings uh, when they find out that the price for being Polish outside of the country, especially in the east, is very high. That every day um, uh, they are required to testify of their Polishness, to speak Polish and think po in Polish, uh, which is not a simple thing. And two other competitions, which were very successful, have been very successful, are policemen in the service of history and uh, the armed forces in the service of history. One, young people who are more and more inclined to study in um, military or police schools, there are so-called um, uniformed uh, high school classes. And here, uh, in this competition, the participants choose a, a hero, a police officer or a military officer murdered in the Katyn massacres. And uh, research their story, and uh, in the end, they are able to travel to uh, those places that are connected with the Katyn massacres. This year, we had an interesting story when we took students to Ostashkov, where Polish officers were held, and uh, it's a monastery. It's an old monastery where the monks have returned, and they have been very open and very hospitable to our Polish. Uh, students, participants of the co of the competition. Uh, we often hear about the Russian state um, belying history, and today we have heard that this cemetery in Miednoye is supposed to be closed for a renewed exhumation, but the monks in Ostashkov were very hospitable, very friendly, and very helpful, so we can see how complex this history is. Uh, Oxford debates, uh, which have uh, are a method uh, that has come from Britain to us, are becoming more and more popular. The idea is to take up topics uh, connected to Polish history of the 20th century uh, for young people to learn to debate, to exchange ideas and opinions. And this year, for the first time, we also had um, a new a form of the Oxford debate where Poles from outside the country were, from the Polish diaspora, were uh, able to participate from Ireland, um, Belgium, the uh, United Kingdom, but also from Ukraine. So it was very, uh, a great, um, very satisfying for us to see that Poles, Poles from Ukraine actually won the uh, debate. Um, trainings, uh, training and conferences for teachers. So a lot of uh, the awareness and the information we want to communicate depends on the teachers. So the more uh, teachers are 
uh, equipped with the instruments and tools of communicating what uh, the uh, international uh, national institute of remembrance scholars have uh, established um, the better for us so uh, one of the programs is called poland in the heart of european history is where we invite uh, teachers of history uh, to Poland to uh, be acquainted with um, our with what we know about the history of Poland, and this these seminars are uh, becoming more and more popular every year. At least forty teachers of uh, European countries visit us, and then the uh, um, modern history meetings for the diaspora are uh, are di directed to teachers of Polish history to uh, Polish uh, students outside of Poland and uh, also we have um, pretty good groups visiting Poland for uh, 10 day sessions visiting different places in Poland this year um, these diaspora teachers were with us in Gdańsk at the um, World War II Museum um, uh, history stops or history bus stops um, began four years ago. Um, four years ago were taken outside of Poland. So today we have uh, history stops in the US, Great Britain, uh, Belgium, uh, Czech Republic, Belarus, and we will soon open one uh, in Latvia, in Daugavpils. And the idea of the um, history stops is that the um, teachers from the National Institute of, of Remembrance arrive um, to teach teachers and also children, have activities for children. So our National Bureau of Education organizes, uh, prepares materials such as um, cartoons and board games and uh, other tools to equip teachers. Multimedia projects um, and the undefeated ones, time for of uh, trial. You may have seen this uh, film on the internet. It has already been viewed by about 23 million uh, people across the world. It's a short animated material which shows um, a, an, an abbreviated form the fate of Poles in the Second World War. It has been translated into 12 languages and posted on the internet. And we have had a, a magnificent response. As a result of this film, you may remember and remember this uh, image of a symbolic um, figure of a Polish soldier squeezed between two walls of two totalitarian regimes. Um, it's one of it's a frame from this film, the undefeated ones, uh, to. These walls are today uh, have been erected in the Piłsudski Square, and you can uh, find yourself between these two walls today. So, the idea is that every visitors, every visitor, not only Poles, because the exhibition is available in four languages, that everyone could experience um, our ex perspective of being uh, crushed from two directions in 1939. We also publish a lot of uh, printed materials, uh, education files or education fo folders are um, target mostly teachers. Here you see examples of brochures, which are very important. Uh, previously, they have uh, been published in the form of patrons of our streets. So the purpose was to show those true heroes whose uh, names should be um, uh, featured in the names of streets uh, in Polish cities. And now we have begun publishing a new series called the uh, um, Heroes of the Indep of Independent Poland. Here you see Stanisław Król Kaszubski, who is featured in the film uh, Legione, which premieres tomorrow. He was the first uh, officer of the Polish legions murdered by the Russians. 
I have also mentioned games, and here we have the cover of the most recently uh, pre created game, that, which is being published as we speak, the Polish underground state, the phenomenon, the phenomenon of the Polish underground state. We must also remember this year we also commemorate the 80th anniversary of its foundation. A unique um, uh, organization of an underground state uh, which operated in all um, aspects of a regular state, um, including uh, ju um, the judiciary uh, system, um, propaganda machine, um, educational um, elements, and every possible part of a regular functioning state. Exhibitions. We have a big, uh, large uh, diversity of uh, exhibitions. Um, the IPN has prepared already uh, dozens of exhibitions every year. We have new ones. Some of them are available on our websites. You can find them on uh, www.ipn.pl. Uh, .gov.pl, and we work together with polls from Australia or Canada who ask us to prepare specific um, exhibitions on specific top topics, um, and they use uh, our website uh, to show them. Um, other exhibitions, which uh, we are particularly eager to show this year, um, the Stolen Childhood, so the Second World War from the perspective of Polish children, a, a shocking exhi exhibition which uh, is traveling throughout the country, which shows what happened to the generation of children um, of the time, what uh, traumatic experiences they uh, went through, and some of them never survived the war. And so this exhibition shows their exhibitions. And another exhibition that you can, can be viewed today um, in the uh, uh, IPN um, building on Marszałkowska, uh, the atrocities on Poles, so the things that have been done to the Poles. Um, so it shows the murders perpetrated on the Polish nation by the Germans, Soviets, and Ukrainian nationalists. Uh, we must remember that the Polish Republic on the in 1939 um, had a population of 34 million. In 1945, there were only 25 Poles in uh, the Polish territory, so we did not lose six million. Six million are the, those who have been uh, who are murdered, but we must remember the 5.5 million who have been deported, who were forced to stay in the Soviet Union or in um, the Western immigration. So. Poland did not return to this uh, population number of 34 million until 1979. So you can see how uh, much time had to pass for Poland to um, return to its original um, population. We are now preparing very basic um, exhibitions for next year. Uh, which communicate the basic information about Polish history of the 20th cent uh, century. One is uh, on the August of 1980, um, very basic photographs. And the second one on the Warsaw Uprising, which uh, uses colored photographs from the period. We, it was very popular the last time we presented it. Every school and every organization and every person, um, private person, can download this exhibition and show it uh, anywhere in the world. Um, we also have uh, special commem anniversary commemoration um, commemorations, things that are not um, usually present in the common remembrance of the Polish people. So the Day of the Cursed Soldiers on March 1st, the National Day of the Remembrance of Poles re uh, Rescuing Jews Under German Occupation, March 24th. Show that you remember is August 1st. It's of course the Pol Warsaw Uprising and light, uh, which shows uh, the Warsaw Uprising without uh, the division between 
regular soldiers and commanders and civilians, which is very common in uh, the uh, regular narrative. But the uh, people of Warsaw were one. There wouldn't have been a Warsaw uprising without its, uh, the city's civilians. There wouldn't have been a daily um, soup. Uh, there wouldn't have been any barricades um, without the civilians. So this year we are publishing a, a music album called 10 Steps, where um, music artists um, present um, songs and music pieces based on the memoirs and uh, diaries of those who experienced the uh, Warsaw Uprising. And then we have um, different actions uh, connected with uh, searching for uh, the victims of totalitarian regimes. So we have Kwetera El, which is the national pantheon at, uh, in the Powązki Cemetery. Just in closing, very briefly, I wanted to show you a few, few illustrations how um, uh, the idea turns into an exhibition. So this was the first idea, the first image on uh, then this turned into this image which you have seen already which we have used in the uh, animated film the undefeated ones then this idea um, we have tried to transfer to the Piłsudski Square close to the uh, headquarters of the Warsaw Garrison and here you can see the walls uh, as they have been erected in the Piłsudski Square this exhibition will be open until the end of September, so uh, please uh, do uh, go and visit this place. This is a very important element of uh, the remembrance of generations, the uh, spoken history, oral history archive of the uh, National Remembrance Institute. Our uh, multimedia department tries to record on video as many um, interviews with witnesses of history as possible. Today we have about 2,000 of these interviews recorded and we hope that soon we will be able to open a website where all these recordings will be available. So by searching um, by a keyword you will be able to find the stories that are of interest to you. And I hope that we will be able to um, make it as detailed as possible. And uh, the last thing I wanted to mention, we are in Warsaw. And this year we commemorate the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the Second World War, including the siege of Warsaw and the defense of Warsaw. So uh, soon we will be publishing the diary of Wacław Lipiński, colonel of the Polish army, legionary, and later a historian in the interwar period. And I remember re reading his books as a young man as uh, uh, in the form of uh, illegal literature, his uh, history of the legions. In September of 1939, which is often a forgotten fact, there were two um, people who maintained the resistance of the Warsovians against the Germans. One of them, of course, was the mayor of Warsaw, Stefan Starzyński, and the other one was um, Colonel Wacław Lipiński. He um, gave daily reports on the radio on the defense of Warsaw, on the um, resistance of the civilians and the soldiers. He gave these addresses on the radio, but also he made very extensive notes every day. And this is uh, going, these notes are going to be uh, published in an audiobook form um, this year. I highly recommend uh, this audiobook. Václav Lipinski was murdered by the communists in 1949, so his uh, life is a um, 
condensed uh, sort of condensed form of the modern history of Poland. Uh, so please visit our uh, exhibitions, our events, participate in our events. I'm very happy to meet you to this morning. I really support your initiative and I hope you uh, grow and develop in the coming years. I'd like to suggest maybe that after the break we could see this short movie. If you haven't seen it, of course we can we can watch it. There is absolutely no problem. Right now I would like to invite Mr. Tomasz Kozłowski, well known for his knowledge about our uh, East Kresy. So we'll start our break. Or, uh, yeah. Good morning. Before I start, there are two short invitations. We've been uh, running a constant cycle of remembrance of uh, our history, and we have so many virtual presentations. This year, we have uh, Independence Crest, uh, 1939. And commemorating uh, the achievements of the Second uh, People's Republic. And the details of this you can view in Świat Kresów in, on Facebook. And I'd like to invite you next year to two meetings within the cycle. I'd like to invite you to, to uh, show um, Kres movie uh, de dedicated to the Grodno defense on the, on, on the 18th of September on Wednesday. Uh, Wehrmacht and Luftwaffe on the, in the Kres in uh, uh, September 39. In present to, uh, relation, narration, we lose the aggression of Germany. And um, um, actually losing of Kress, Kress uh, it, it was the, fir, in the first case, um, it was the result of German aggression and um, invasion. And I'd like to invite you to this, to this presentation. Last year, we had... Last year, we uh, commemorated the uh, centenary of the Polish, of in the independence of Poland this year. We are greatly involved in commemorating the 80th anniversary of the German and Soviet invasion of Poland. This um, uh, dual uh, force of Germany and the Soviet Union, which erased the Second Polish Republic from the map of Europe. And I would like to take you further back into the past to uh, the events of 100 years ago. And so my presentation is on the centenary of the independence of uh, the eastern borderlands. Last year in November, we spoke about what happened uh, 100 years before in, uh, in November of 1918, when we organized na nationwide um, celebrations of, the, uh, uh, of Poland's independence. I must admit that um, I was uh, a bit embarrassed about this, uh, the narrative of those co celebrations because it seemed that uh, they uh, um, um, created the false image of uh, the year 1918 as if Poland just popped out of the blue and became an independent country on that one day, erasing the thousands of events uh, which contributed uh, to the actual um, um, 
uh, to to the actual cre recreation of the Polish state. It seems that the Poles uh, are uh, well uh, well resistant to the same famous words of Marcus Tullius Cicero, who said that history is um, a test. Uh, is a, a test, um, witness of the times, the light of truth, life of memory, and teacher of life. We prefer to feed on myths, um, to uh, feed on simplified tales, and not on what require on that which requires a bit more uh, effort, but um, helps us to um, find the true essence of real events. So 100 years um, before, in the November 1918, uh, Poland controlled uh, the central regions of the Polish uh, Republic with Mazovia, Małopolska, the Lublin region, in the east, immense territories uh, were occupied by the German troops, German forces in the southeast, in uh, eastern Małopolska, former eastern Galicia. We had um, UK the Ukrainian state, which was uh, created in November. This is our starting point in 1918. But this map, is unknown to most Poles because we um, boast about other, about different maps. Uh, but uh, though this map is, um, it is worth having this map before our eyes to understand what happened in the following year, 1919. Uh, we need to remember that between 1915 and 1918, um, Vilnius in the north was occupied by the Germans who entered the city in 1915 and occupied uh, Vilnius until November, uh, until December of 1918. We also need to remember that the census uh, carried out by the Germans showed more than 50% of the Poles, 50% uh, of the population being Poles and uh, forty some percent uh, of uh, uh, population being Jewish. Another map that most Poles don't know is uh, the, this map of Europe from 1918, when an, a, a huge part of Eastern Europe, Europe was occupied by the Central Powers, mostly Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire beginning with Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, a, most of Belarus and practically all of Ukraine, all the way down to Crimea, is occupied by Germany. Um, we must underscore it again. It is Germany that is occupying these territories. This is the starting point in the autumn of 1918. But it will also be uh, the uh, um, starting point until 1919. Uh, the, we must add to this more and stronger and stronger aspirations of uh, other nations trying to create independent uh, countries in uh, territories that the Poles believe to be theirs. In Lithuania, the Lithuanians uh, found Tariba, the Lithuanian uh, State Council, which announces um, the independence of Latvia. Poland celebrates her independence, uh, the, uh, celebrates the centenary of her independence last year in November. For the Lithuanians, uh, the day was in February, seven months before. And of course, this is an um, elusive uh, independence under German oversight. Uh, the uh, um, Act of Independence of Lithuania was written in Lithuanian and German until last year. It was held in the diplomatic archives in Berlin in the folder uh, titled uh, The Future of the Baltic Eastern uh, Provinces. But also, we need to underscore that 
the German uh, supervision had another dimension, that the German uh, duke was imposed as the king of Lithuania, who he never took, actually took uh, reign of Lithuania, but he was the one to be uh, crowned Mendog II. The Germans withdrew from Vilnius in early January 1919, when the Bolshevik army approaches Vilnius. So uh, uh, Lithuanians also evacuate Vilnius together with the Germans. And that's when the Poles try to fight for Vilnius uh, funding the um, self-defense of Lithuania and Belarus under um, a Polish general. Uh, the Poles try uh, take over Vilnius, take control of Vilnius for only three days because on November the 5th, Vilnius is uh, captured by the Bolsheviks. It is also then um, that we uh, that the Vilnius eaglets uh, come on the stage. We only know about the Vil eaglets, eaglets of Lviv uh, or Lvov. Um, there are there are the young fighters for Polish Vilno. Um, uh, for for example, the 15-year-old uh, Boy Scout uh, Janusz Petpomaranski. Who fought for Polish Vilno together with soldiers, contracts uh, heavy disease, uh, um, serious disease, and dies a few days later. Um, Vil Vilno is lost on the 5th January 1919 when the city is entered by the Bolsheviks. And um, this date begins a several months of Bolshevik reign in Vilnius or Vilno. In the north, in territories which uh, we um, refer to with just one word, Kresy, we have something which uh, we could call the, the um, Vilnian Gordic uh, knot. Uh, so the territories of the former uh, Grand uh, Duchy of Lithuania. For us, the northern Kresy are still occupied uh, by um, still withdrawing uh, German forces. The German forces, uh, which are moving towards the Baltic uh, in order to uh, make their way to Germany uh, through uh, East Prussia, the Poles. Uh, the uh, Polish um, control reaches only a little bit beyond Womża. Even Suwałki are still not in the Polish hands. In the south, all the way up to uh, um, Brest-Litovsk, um, is the uh, the control of the territory of the West U Western Ukrainian um, uh, People's Republic. It is then and from here these immense territories in the east are controlled by Bolshevik forces. The Germans, Bolsheviks, Ukrainians and the Poles over here. So uh, this is a, a uh, very great uh, abbreviation of the situation in 1919, which was a key year for uh, the eastern territories of the former Polish Republic. Piłsudski, in February of 1918, uh, says these, um, uh, uh, these um, historic words, uh, uh, Right now, Poland is practically without borders, and everything we can gain in the West dip, uh, in this man matter depends on the Entente and of how far they want to squeeze Germany. In the East, uh, the East is a different matter. This is a door which opens and closes, and it depends who and how widely opens it by force. 
the East is a matter, is an open matter and depends on the determination and on the force that is shown. The Poles are aware that Vil Vilno is to become the capital city of the Lithuanian state, which had been uh, revived in February. So uh, the Lithuanians uh, must be contacted. So Piłsudski sends Michał Romer with a secret mission to Kaunas. One of the, um, Romer is one of the uh, representatives of the uh, Vilnian uh, Poles who uh, sorry, the Lithuanian locals who dreams of um, the um, independent Lithuanian state. Um, uh, Michał Romer's uh, diaries of 1916-1919 uh, shed a, a very valuable light of what happens between Poland and Lithuania. On the one hand, Piłsudski really sends Romer to negotiate with the Lithuanians to search for a, a model of um, combined, of a combined common uh, state. But the question is, will the Lithuanians agree to this uh, offer? Michał Romer himself feels Lithuanian, which he does not hide. But when Piłsudski sends uh, Romer in, in, in April 1919 to Kaunas to negotiate uh, with the Lithuanians. His, he, on the other hand, he is preparing a, a military operation to take v Vilno by force. On uh, April 6th in Warsaw, Piłsudski uh, says to Michał Romer, um, the marshal's brother, Jan Piłsudski, says that Piłsudski has already pinpointed the date of capturing Vilno on uh, for on uh, a Good Saturday, and that Piłsudski would enter Vilno personally. So on April 6, 1919, two gentlemen uh, talk together, and one of them says to the other that in two weeks, on a uh, at Easter, on Easter day, we would be in Vil Vilno, and this seems to be a mad idea, but it is implemented with incredible precision. Three groups, uh, Iwaszkiewicz, Listowski, and Ryc Śmigły groups, are concentrated between Białystok and Chełm in order to strike east on Lida, Nowogródek, Baranowicze, Pinsk, all the way to Sarne. This is an area controlled by both the Bolsheviks. In the south, we have territories under Ukrainian control. This uh, idea seems militarily absurd because it requires um, a spearheading and breaking a, um, a wedge between uh, the uh, German and Lithuanian detachments in the north and the Red Army uh, in the uh, southeast, uh, risking uh, being um, uh, at the risk of being cut off on their way to Vilno. So the operation is planned. Uh, so the plan is to first strike east, uh, Baranowicza, Nowogródek, and Lida, and to capture the key railway line, which leads to Vilna. Because in order to capture a city the size of Vilna, which is uh, uh, has a hundred thousand, a population of one hundred thousand, you need to um, bring troops into the city, and the railways are uh, key in this operation. So, the the uh, Polish forces um, strike at Baranowicza, Nowogródek, and Lida. And uh, as a result, Vilno is captured in April. 
Um, a beautiful eulogy on this uh, operation has been written by Yuliushka Denbandrovsky. It's a small little book which describes uh, the uh, Vilnius expedition. And of course, uh, it's uh, written in a literary language and um, made more like historical fiction. So on the, a, April 16th, um, Baranovica is uh, attacked and then uh, Novogrudek and Lida. And as you can see, uh, the Poles uh, really attack Lida in order to capture the railway line towards Vilna. The Polish forces are separated, some of them. A part is sent ahead. It's the cavalry. And the idea is for the cavalry to open the way to Vil Vilno and to be followed by uh, the infantry. Lida is captured and Piłsudski moves towards Lida. We take Lida and under the legendary uh, legionary um, officer Belina uh, Prażmowski um, uh, the, so Belina Prażmowski leads the cavalry north it's a very risky forced march of the cavalry without the support of the infantry which remains in the south and they head for Vilna A small uh, interlude here. At the same time, uh, a great uh, painter, Ferdinand Ruszczyz, sets out for Vilna from his home in Bogdanov, where he draws and paints and while he waits for the Bolsheviks to be uh, chased away. In his notes from the spring of 1919, he describes the, his way in beautiful words from Novogrudek uh, region towards Vilna. He travels via Taboryszki, Turgiela, and in Turgiela he runs into Polish cavalry, is, which makes a huge impression on him because he's surprised to see Polish uh, Ulans in this place. Um, the Polish Ulans under Władysław Belina Prażmowski and uh, the later General Gustav Orlicz Drescher are setting out um, to capture Vilno. Vilno, which cannot even be seen from the south, it is hidden in a uh, valley uh, concealed by uh, hills. And over these hills, the troops have to uh, reach the town. Of course, the, uh, Vilna did not look uh, like this at the time. This is a, a current photograph, the center of Vilna surrounded by neighborhoods. But it is these uh, hills, uh, these heights, that the Polish cavalry had to cross to reach Vilna. So it is. Uh, fascinating because Belina Prażmowski's uh, cavalry numbered as many as 700 sabers, more or less, but Vilno is a town of 100,000. So from a military point of view, to attack a um, thickly populated town, a well-developed town inhabited by 100,000 uh, residents, with a group of 700 cavalry seems to be absurd, absurd, but there is only one chance of success that the Bolshevik garrison stationed in Vilna is surprised, is taken by surprise. A hundred years ago, there were no cell phones. You could not uh, communicate, uh, transfer information within seconds you can count on uh, the element of surprise. So this is really what happens. Um, Polish cavalry concentrates in the southern outskirts of Vilno, and their task is to capture um, the railway station in the south uh, part of Vilno. 
if we can capture the railway station, we will be able to bring the infantry from Lida in the south. And this is what happens. And then the cavalry, now dismounted, of course, not on horseback, but dismounted, enters the thick maze of uh, the streets of Vilna, reaches the cathedral square, where the Bolsheviks are completely surprised. They are caught by surprise, and the Bolshevik move across the Vilna to the other side of the city beyond the Green Bridge, and it is this is how, on April 19th, Piłsudski, who is still in Lida, is able to write these words. On April 19th, I'm in Lida, everything is all right. The railway line has been repaired. Um, Belina is uh, calling for the infantry to come quickly. The, the carriages are ready. I receive a dispatch from Paris, wait for Haller's army but I am going to Vilna. I set out for Vilna in a, a, a railway carriage uh, exploding with joy. And it is true that, uh, according to his own words, on Easter of 1919, the Poles enter Vilna. At the railway station, uh, Piłsudski is um, welcome with a great ceremony. After a century and a half, almost, without Polish presence, uh, Poland enters Vilna again. Oh, it, was, it had only been for three days that the Polish uh, forces were able to capture Vilno in uh, late December and early of 1918 and early January of 1919. So this great um, ceremony at the railway station and then Piłsudski sets out for the center of the city. And as Piłsudski had um, said two weeks prior, um, the Polish troops um, photographed themselves in uh, the cathedral square in Vilno. Cavalrymen, Polish troops, Polish infantry. In Ostra Brama, uh, there is a ceremonial mass with uh, Piłsudski, Berlina Prażmowski, and other officers participating. A witness of this mass writes the great um, sob of this crowd kneeling in the street. I looked at the commandant. He stood there facing the painting, uh, leaning on his saber, um, somber, uh, with a heavy tear flowing from, un from his eyes, from under his heavy eyebrows to his mus mustache. Schmigwe had a sort of uh, nervous tick on his face. His face twitched and Tears were flowing down his face, and Belina, Belina Prażmowski, the uh, commander of the cavalry, was uh, wailing like uh, a little boy. And this was Easter of 1919. This um, ad advance of, on Vilno cost the life of 28 Polish soldiers killed in the capture of the city. They will um, be the first ones um, to be buried in the part of the Rosa Cemetery, where later the heart of Piłsudski will be buried. Uh, the a shadow on uh, this, uh, this victory is beshadowed by a pogrom of the Jewish population of Vilna, where uh, probably about a hundred uh, Vilna Jews will lose their lives. This will be shadow the uh, Polish Jewish relations in Vilna. This issue will later be studied studied by Henry Morgenthau's uh, American uh, mission, and the United States will later continually monitor Polish Jewish relations. This story. Uh, this history begins from the pogrom in Lwów in 1918 and uh, Vilna in 1919. From that moment on, the United States Senate 
uh, feels entitled to interfere with Polish matters. It is then that, that after the capture of Wilno, Piłsudski uh, issues his famous address to the residents of the Grand Duke Duchy of Lithuania, uh, promising a free election and um, settling the ethnic and religious issues according to the uh, will of the residents. The beautiful words of this address in four languages is uh, posted in posters across Vilna. In uh, at spring of 1919, at the uh, Easter of 1919, the Polish uh, troops uh, um, dominate the square in front of the Vil Vilna Cathedral, and then triumphant um, demonstrations and uh, celebrations take place across the city. Those events are commemorated by the uh, photographs taken at the time. The best po uh, photographer of uh, Vilna, Jan Buchak, of photographs Józef Piłsudski in his atelier, in his studio. This uh, beautiful photograph of Piłsudski taken after the capture of Vilna in 1919. And also we have here Władysław Belina Prażmowski and Edward Rydz-Śmigły, as well as Mariusz Zaruski who was uh, the commander of the cavalry regiment uh, or General Orlich Drescher. Those who captured Vilno, among those who captured Vilno is also the famous Wladysław Dąbrowski, uh, a code name Łupaszka, the first, because the f later one uh, took his uh, nom de guerre. In Vilna, Piłsudski meets with his family, his loved ones. The operation is crowned with an appropriate uh, commemorative badge and a medal awarded to its participants. But Vilna will be uh, besieged by Bolshevik troops for the next several months. Vilna will be enclosed in a encircled like Lvov had been in the south. It is then uh, that the great poet Władysław Broniewski arrives in Vilno in his legionary uniform to describe uh, this uh, Polish Vilno breathing a different air after being taken by the Polish forces. Ruszczyc, who is appointed uh, Dean of the Arts Department at the uh, recreated University of Vilna, will become the main, uh, um, one of the main uh, founders of this university. This year we not only celebrate, commemorate the um, 100th anniversary of um, the return of the Polish Republic to the Vilna re region, but also the 100 years of uh, the, cre the recreation of the Stefan Batory University, which had been closed by um, the Russians. But neither of those uh, uh, anniversaries uh, have been noticed by the Polish uh, government uh, today, because the uh, 100th anniversary of the capture of the Kresy or the recreation of the uh, Stefan Batory University fit in uh, to today's um, history, history policy, uh, which avoids uh, instigating conflict with our Lithuanian neighbor. It was then that uh, in 1919, in the autumn of 1919, when the university, Stefan Batory University is open, St uh, Piłsudski arrives and receives the keys to uh, the city of Vilna, the commemorative keys of, uh, to the city uh, are uh, designed by uh, the president of the university, Ferdinand Ruszczyc. The keys were later held in the Muse of Piłsudski Museum in, Bel in the Belvedere Palace. And also here, it was also here that his uniform from the Vilna operation was held. This um, a special event of 1919 is also commemorated by one more tiny thing, which uh, uh, 
stirs special um, emotions in all Poles visiting Ostra Brahma when Jan Buchak um, photographed the chapel of the, in Ostra Brahma in the interwar period. He took a photograph of a tiny silver plaque uh, with the inscription, Thank you, Mother, for Vilno. In the album, it is captioned a, a votive of an unknown um, donor for um, offered by uh, offered f by an unknown um, donor for uh, the um, recapture of Vilno, and the unknown donor was Yusef Piłsudski. When you are in Ostra Brama today, find this tiny plaque among those thousands of votives. Um, this tiny plaque saying, thank you, mother, for Vilna. This is Yusef, Yusef Piłsudski's uh, plaque, which he wanted to make sure to place there. An, 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 animous, an, an, anonymously. <laughs> the capture of Vilna has become a legend, and uh, it through literary and artistic works uh, painted by Ruszczyc and other artists and a uh, prominent uh, painter of Wilno, Ludomir Śledziński, uh, painted a beautiful, um, created a beautiful painting in 1927 showing uh, Piłsudski and the capture of Vilno in uh, symbolic terms. You can see Piłsudski here with binoculars surrounded by his faithful officers. All those present in this uh, painting are not uh, there by accident. They are all historic figures. And of course, it, this is not what it looked like exactly because Piłsudski arrived in Vilna by train. He was not in command of the attack, of the advance, but these are just details. So one more time. In April, it, on uh, at Easter of 1919, the uh, uh, Polish Republic reborn, which had just been reborn in the autumn of 1918, captures Vilno and also the Vilnius um, region with it. What happens in the, in the south? At the same time, in the south, we have uh, a different um, clash, a Polish-Ukrainian clash of the eagle and the tri tri uh, trident. If you go to Lwów, to this uh, uh, Lwów uh, Defender Cemetery, which is still or again um, uh, called uh, the cemetery of the, the Eaglet Cemetery, you can um, see at the entrance uh, to the cemetery, you can see a memorial which had been unveiled by the Polish and Ukrainian presidents uh, commemorating Ukrainian uh, soldiers of the Ukrainian um, Halic uh, army who fought against the Poles in 1918 um, and 1919 for independence Ukraine in the former Eastern Galicia. We need to remember that until the First World War, Lvov, of course, with a bit of uh, hyperbole, uh, but we can say that Lvov is an uncr the uncrowned um, unofficial uh, Polish uh, capital, uh, the capital of Poland under the partitions, because it is the capital city of the uh, Austrian partition, which, uh, because of the Galician, uh, because the uh, Galician autonomy, uh, autonomous Galician region uh, allows for uh, free uh, growth of uh, Pol Polish community. The Ukrainians speak about it with bitterness. They speak of a great, well-organized uh, Polish enclave. Um, 
This is what Jakub, uh, Jakub Holowacki says to Osip Bodiański in 1845. Polishness has uh, squashed everything, uh, strangling uh, Ruthenia. Uh, a, um, the educated Ruthenian is ashamed of his language. He grabs onto the Polish language. It's easier for him to express himself in the Polish language. Uh, the language of education and high society than in his own language. Well, Ivan Franco uh, says the Poles could easily think that Galicia has no Ruthenia, that it is one Polish nation under German occupation. In 1861, uh, the Ukrainian um, um, poet Platon Kostetsky of Lvov, after uh, says of uh, the Hrodelna Union, which created the tri union of Poland, Lithuania, and Ukraine, Ukraine. He says, in the name of the Father and the Son, this is our prayer. As the Trinity is one, so is Poland, Ruthenia, and Lithuania one. One uh, uh, divine queen prays for us from Częstochowa. Pochayev, which is a, a whole uh, a sacred place for the Ukrainians, and Ostra Brama, which was a, a sacred place for the Lithuanians. But at the break of the 19th century, the uh, re, the um, new Ukrainian national movement uh, had a new aspiration of creating an independent Ukrainian state. Ukrainians did not want to, no longer wanted to, uh, no longer wanted to sing uh, Poland has not yet perished. They wanted to now sing, the Ukrainians sing a song which would eventually become the Ukrainian national anthem. I reminded you of what happened in the north uh, how the Lithuanians had um, announced the independence of the uh, Lithuanian state in February of 1918. What happened in uh, the South the, uh, in 1917 after the Bolshevik Ukrainian, uh, the Ukrainian Central Council is founded in 1917. In September, in the January of 1918, the Central Ukrainian Council declares uh, Ukrainian independence in uh, their independence declaration of January 1918, the Ukrainians say, beginning today, the Ukrainian People's Republic becomes an independent, a sovereign, free, free um, state of the Ukrainian nation. And we, I, the Poles did not uh, ratify the um, uh, foundation of the Polish independent state until nine months later. Uh, the situation in the South is affected by uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk uh, with Ukraine uh, made on um, February 9th, 1918. The Germans and the Austrians make a peace treaty with this new Ukrainian state in Brest-Litovsk. And in this treaty, um, the Ukrainians promise to deliver uh, wheat and grain to the starving Germans and Ukrainians, Ukraine, which is still the breadbasket of Europe, um, agrees to, and in exchange, they are promised not only Eastern Ukraine, not only Galicia, but also uh, uh, territories uh, considered to be ethnically Polish, uh, home region Podlasie and a part of Małopolska. This is where the frontier was supposed to run. These towns were all to fall to Ukraine, not to speak of Brest. In the secret protocol attached to this treaty, a special clause was included saying that those parts of Galicia 
mostly inhabited by Ukrainians, would be separated from the Kingdom of Galicia and connected, joined with Bukovina to create a new state. The Germans forced the, the Austrians to keep Lvov Tarnopol and Stanislavov uh, to transfer those to the Ukrainians. It was at that time that, and but not only, that uh, these maps of Great Ukraine were drawn in Kiev, uh, reaching all the way to Helm, Przemysl, and Yaroslav. And all this uh, was according in accordance to the German First World War um, military doctrine or political doctrine um, of Middle Europa. This idea, um, according to this idea, uh, Eastern Europe would be um, occupied by um, states, uh, um, German uh, states, uh, German satellite states, um, Baltic states, a Polish state, and a Ukrainian state. Throughout the First World War, the Germans uh, supported uh, Ukrainian and Lithuanian national movements, uh, which to them uh, seemed like an effective counterweight for Polish aspirations. Um, allow me to remind you again that at the end of 1918, the German and the Austrian army con control all of Ukraine, including Crimea and parts of the Caucasus. Uh, and this is how the Ukrainians, supported by the uh, um, Austrians and also partially Germans, are able to implement uh, their own uh, independence program, just like the Lithuanians. On October 16th, 1918, the, Austria, the Emperor of Austria issues a, a manifesto to uh, the nations of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where he promises to create a federation, um, and within this federation, national states. On, on October 19th, uh, three days later, uh, representatives of the Ukrainian um, of Ukraine Ukrainian. Uh, announced the establishment of the Ukrainian National Council and um, to, to create a uh, Ukrainian state under the Habsburg monarchy. The Poles think that Poland was surprised uh, by uh, on this October 19th because Ukrainians have never said, had never said that they wanted to uh, govern Eastern Galicia. It's not true. The, the, the Ukrainians had been speaking about it openly, but the Poles, of course, had uh, um, underestimated them and disregarded these uh, statements. So on October 19th, a Ukrainian political formation, a sort of Erzatz Ukrainian parliament, is created in Lvov. Um, and the Ukrainian uh, National Council is uh, established. In Poland, at the same time, uh, the Regency Council on October 7th announces uh, the establishment of an independent Polish state. Uh, the Regency Council sends its representative to Lwów, the future Prime Minister, Władysław Sikorski, who is to prepare the takeover of Lwów and East Ga Eastern Galicia for the reborn Polish state. The historical paradox here is that Władysław Sikorski leaves Lwów one day before it is captured by the Ukrainians on the last day of October 1918. Władysław Sikorski leaves Lwów for, uh, for Przemysl. It is not a good testimony of his um, competence 
in Lvov, the Poles can count on uh, several hundred men under arms. One of the uh, uh, most powerful accusations against the Polish neglect of uh, 1918 comes from uh, the uh, French Jacques Krishak of uh, a, a journalist of uh, Krakow. A small booklet, uh, The Days of Terror in Lvov. Uh, this uh, witness of events in Lvov um, gave an account of those events. This is where he was, uh, um, this Ukrainian takeover found him. And this is where he wrote. On October 24th, a, a pompous demonstration or manifestation was organized <laughs> where 20,000 people were gathered singing, Poland has not yet perished and we shall not surrender the land. They believed that the, uh, they could thus secure uh, the Polishness of Lvov against the appetite of Ukrainian uh, of Ukrainians and the perfidy of their German-Austrian uh, allies. They thought that uh, things would just kind of get sorted out, and so things did get sorted out. The Poles could have taken control of the largest um, city in the eastern uh, uh, territories of the former Polish Republic with just uh, uh, several hundred men under arms. Um, because in the last days of October and beginning of November, Polish uh, underground organizations, which uh, were at odds with each other, gathered again to um, make peace with each other. And But their debate centered around who would command the troops, not what to do to take uh, control of Lvov, but who would be in command. And nobody would... Um, and uh, nobody w wanted to um, surrender uh, uh, ground. Just before midnight, the frustrated chairman of the meeting said, let's go to sleep now and let's reconvene ag again in the morning. But that night, the Ukrainians um, take control of Lvov with the uh, Sotnia commander Dmitro Vitovsky. Um, accelerates the capture of Lvov, and in the morning, the residents of Lvov are uh, awakened by the sight of uh, the blue and yellow flag on the city hall. The Ukrainians take the city hall, the post office, uh, military depots, and other significant buildings in the city. And the city is, is um, patrolled by U Ukrainian uh, city patrols. A city which is primarily Polish with 30% uh, or so of Jews and uh, only 11% um, of Ukrainians. And it is Ukrainians that take control of the city. It is not the first time that history um, the the the, Pol, the Poles are um, met with this sort with this fat, fate. The new Ukrainian state eventually is called the Western Ukrainian uh, People's Republic. We are talking about the um, Ukrainian attack on Lvov, but uh, we need to remember that on the first, second, and third of November, in three days, the Ukrainians captured and took control of the in, entire ter, uh, territory of uh, East, uh, Eastern Galicia. This list of cities can, be, uh, can go on and on. They did not only capture Lvov, but they captured all of Eastern Galicia. Franciszek Salese Krysiak in his brochure says, uh, brutally states um, who is to be blamed. He said that Lvov should be ashamed of itself. 
that it uh, was so surprised, so taken by surprise, with uh, not having done anything to stop uh, this uh, the progress of events. It was uh, tied up like a, a sheep, um, like the drunken uh, Zagwoba uh, in um, a, the pig pen. We, one more time, we underestimated the Ukrainians and the Austrian and German policy. And this is how, beginning on, on November 1st, uh, 1918, um, the Southeast is governed by the West Ukrainian uh, People's Republic, which organizes it, uh, its own administration, its troops having eventually an army of 40,000, 40,000 troops. It issues its own uh, currency, post uh, marks, and so on. So in a, uh, in a word, it organizes an entire infrastructure of the new state. And of course, uh, the history of the Western Ukrainian People's Republic, as many uh, shared topics of Polish-Ukrainian history, is full of uh, myths and falsification on both uh, sides of the story. We don't tell this story at all. The Ukrainians tell this story in beautiful tales. The uh, History of Ukraine, pu published for Polish students in Lublin a few years ago, Jarosław Hrycak says, that the well-organized Ukrainian state provided full, uh, complete uh, um, security, and there were no um, uh, there were no acts of violence against the Poles, and also the Polish sa side is unaware of the strength of the new army of the uh, of the army of the new Ukrainian state, which was a regular army equipped and outfitted and often commanded by Austrian and German officers. Of course, there is no uh, awareness of uh, acts of violence against the Polish population uh, on Polish villages uh, in Biuka Szlachecka alone, uh, several dozen uh, residents are murdered by Ukrainians in Zwotów, um people are uh, murdered in a, for who later receive a beautiful maus mausoleum uh, the then archbishop of Lvov writes uh, about uh, this uh, these acts of violence uh, camps are set up internment camps for, camps for poles are set up such as the famous Kosatov camp, and uh, also it was all. If it wasn't for the small group of the defenders of uh, Przemysl and young people of Przemysl, the Ukrainians would have also captured Przemysl. Eventually, as you know, the Poles managed to open the way to Lvov, and on November 22nd, the Poles enter Lvov. A Polish flag returned to uh, the city hall. Piłsudski arrives, and the war for East Galicia, which would take months, uh, begins. At the end of 1918, only Lwów was um, under Polish control connected to the Polish territories by this thin um, line of uh, thread of the rail railway line. And uh, the, the Poles even uh, lose control of that for a short time uh, when Lvov is cut off. Uh, the uh, Ukrainian controlled territories reach all, all the way to Przemysl and Dobromil. It's not until sep uh, January of 1919 that the Polish offensive begins. Uh, first, Bowes, a historic, the historic city of Bowes is captured. Then uh, the peacemakers arrive in uh, the form of a Franco-British uh, mission, which tries to 
um, mediate uh, negotiations between the two sides, um, of course, uh, minding mainly French and British interests and not Polish or Ukrainian interests. The um, Ukrainian uh, headquarters are located in Khodorov, between Stanisławów and Lwów, where the Polish industry um, tycoons built the largest sugar plant between uh, before World War I and where the Germans and Austrians had their headquarters uh, later on. And today, now uh, this place was occupied by the Ukrainians. Eventually, um, many of the Ukrainian commanders uh, we will see uh, Simon Petlura in this large group of Ukrainian officers. But meantime, uh, meanwhile, the enclave, the Lvov enclave, is being defended, and also the Poles try not to waste this uh, um, victory of November 1918 fighting until the spring of uh, 1919 a Polish, uh, with Polish uh, pilots playing a, lar a significant role. Let's uh, remember that Lwów is the place where Polish aviation is born in uh, 1919 and where the um, badge of the Polish Air Force is born also in 1919, the um, Czech uh, Square. It is from Lwów that uh, the uh, um, planes of the Polish aircraft, uh, Air Force take off. The needs are so great that in order to relieve um, the men in, on patrol and reconnaissance missions, a, uh, the first Polish uh, women's uh, military formation uh, is created uh, the uh, Auxiliary Women's League and um, several thousand of these women will uh, give their lives in the uh, struggle for Eastern Galicia. In May of 1919, the Great Offensive under General Józef Haller will set out to Volynia and east of Lvov, pushing out uh, the Ukrainian forces from Volynia and uh, Małopols East Eastern Małopolska. In heavy combat, they capture um, Żukiew and st uh, through Stanisławów. You can see here uh, the entrance of the Poles into Stanisławów. Let's also add that these um, uh, areas in the south are also controlled by Romanian forces. Uh, the Polish Air Force um, plays a significant role controlling and uh, watching the movements of the Ukrainian troops uh, from the air. Finally, um, in late spring, May and June and uh, July of 1919, the Polish forces managed to push the Ukrainians across the Zbruch, the frontier river. The Polish uh, forces will not continue east because uh, under um, a treaty between Piłsudski and Petlu Petlura, the Zbruch will be the frontier between the Poles and the Ukraines. The Poles will give away Kamieniec, Podolski, Winnica, Bar, and many other the towns on across the Zbruch, east of Zbruch, and the conflict will end with the famous Polish-Ukrainian agreement made by Marshal Piłsudski uh, on the Polish side and Petlura on the Ukrainian side, which will make um, the uh, enemies into allies and this alliance will enable the Polish offensive on Kiev. We need to remember that it was that year, it was this year, it is this year to 2019, which is, uh, which commemorates 
the key events, uh, events that are key in the history of the Polish heritage in the East, um, commemorates 100 years of the Polish, um, um, the rebirth of the Polish fr Eastern frontier, but we have not heard anything about this in public debate in uh, um, the uh, public speeches of the uh, representatives of the, Pol of the Polish government. We hear nothing about the 100th anniversary of the independence of the Polish eastern borderlands. We here are trying to commemorate these events um, by organizing meetings, um, film showings, and um, uh, through the cycle of um, or a series of talks on independent Eastern borderlands. It's not this year, it does not only commemorate the loss of the Eastern borderlands and the Polish independence under a German and Soviet invasion, but also the 100th, and 100th anniversary of um, the rebirth of independent um, Poland in the Eastern Polish borderlands. So if you can find the time and the energy, I would like to encourage you to communicate this simple narrative to the others. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a couple minutes if you wanted to answer some questions. Are there any questions? Let me give you the mic. It's the truth that we criticize ourselves, but there is the truth that we know not much about this Austrian intrigue. and. Um, the people, were, when they were leaving, they were causing intrigue and they were using the minorities and telling to uh, weaken both enemies, both Russian and uh, Polish. We know this from memoirs. When the Poles oh, they were supposed to stay somewhere in Vilna, Vilnius, but they were uh, um, re regaining Polish properties. I feel that I was trying to portray in this uh, presentation the German and Austrian policy or politics in this part of Europe in 1918, which is really a policy anti-Polish policy and the Brest Treaty in the greater part of the Lithuanian and Austrian activities are really clear and I was underlying it quite often and what we have an issue with is to talk about it honestly, because it seems really unfair that speaking the truth as of history as it was will um, undermine good relations with the neighboring um, or friendly, uh, will underline the friendly relations with many countries surrounding us. This is the history. We cannot change it, and there is no reason not to talk about it. But please notice what's the historical uh, narrative. In case of Polish-Ukrainian conflict, it turns out we show only the bad Ukrainian who attacks with a knife and a, a Pole who's really innocent and there is no information than this innocent Pole because of his foolishness was not ready properly and is mainly uh, responsible for not using his chances but also withdraws 
and there is no information about politics of the key players in the scene of Europe, in this part of Europe, as Germany and Austro-Hungary. Last year, all of Poland was celebrating in many different ways an anniversary of regaining independence. But when there was an anniversary of Brest Treaty, a treaty that was so um, uh, powerful and really influencing our history, there were only a few articles in the press, some meetings, and this information was minimal to the the information was available to the public it was totally marginalized but let's let us remember if we talk about polish ukrainian conflict and regaining in 1919 regaining małopolsk eastern małopolska let us remember the start two European superpowers, Austro-Hungary and, and, and Germany, in February 1918, in official um, international treaty, they guarantee Ukrainians, they guaranteed Lviv, Tarnopol, Stanisławov, Przemysl, Jarosław, Helm, Vodava, and other dozens of other towns. If Ukrainians start to take over these terrains on the 1st of November 1918, we can say they have a full title for that. Two European superpowers in an international treaty, they guaranteed the, them the right to these territories. We don't want to mention the consequences of this treaty because we'd have to talk about the extreme anti-Polish policy by the Germans and Austria-Hungary. And I know it sounds harsh, it sounds bad, it doesn't give a good image. It doesn't have anything to do with the current great relations with Austrians and Hungarians. But for God's sake, we can't not we cannot say this history as it is. We cannot talk about it as it is. Right now it's time for a break. Will you be here in an hour and a half or tomorrow? Let's remember those questions for tomorrow. I'll introduce Master Maciej Czarkowski from the committee. And before the break, I'd like to talk about technical issues. There is refreshments in the back of the room. Right after the next uh, lecture, we can go downstairs for lunch today and tomorrow. Toilets are to the right from the room. And you have to go through the gallery, and they're at the end of the gallery. Or go downstairs where we have lunches. There's uh, other toilets. And there is one more information. At the exit, there is a few. There are a few books, and the books are uh, from the meeting house, and you can take them. Not all of them will be a, maybe appealing to you right away, but because since we have them, we can share them with you, and you're welcome to to take them. They're for free. Thank you very much. And about books. We have two authors here, or three authors here. 
Agnieszka Rybak and Joanna Smuka who will be speaking after the break. There is uh, their book and the book by Roger Morehouse. First, again, the history of Polish Poland, 1939. They're uh, available for purchase in our bookstore. So uh, I'll see you at 12.30.